today we are in our second uh, message for this series called Multiplication Tables. And last week we were talking about the Trinity, which is kind of you know, difficult to get our minds wrapped around. Today we're going to talk about maybe something that's a little simpler, uh, but not any less important. And we're going to talk about the disciples. Um, last week we were talking about you know, three and one and one and three. Today we're talking about one times twelve. And, um, and, and so, yeah, so the multiplication tables, you know, that's how it's going to play in. We're looking at 1 times 12. And Jesus decides that he is going to invest himself in 12 particular people. And, um, and what I want you to understand today is that when Jesus made this decision, when Jesus was pursuing who to pursue, okay, he did that through prayer. And he went before his father and he, he spent all night, the Bible tells us, praying about these people that he was going to invest in because it was that important. Um, and, and so I want you to understand that the, the calling didn't come without careful consideration. That when Jesus was calling his disciples, it was a very intentional decision that he made. And because it's a very intentional decision he made, it required a very intentional decision on their part. And, and I want you to understand this morning that to be a follower of Jesus is not something we just do haphazardly. It's not just something we say, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll follow. Because you, you need to understand that to follow Jesus is a very serious matter. In fact, if you want an easy life, I would not encourage you to follow Jesus. A lot of people think, oh, if I follow Jesus, then everything's going to work out. Isn't that the way it's supposed to work? That if I follow God, then he's supposed to answer all my prayers the way I want them answered. Wrong answer. If, if Yeah, guess again. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're basically turning every answer over to him. And you're saying, whatever you want is what I'm going to get. Not my will, but your will be done. Right? Is even what his own son, Jesus, prayed. Not my will, but your will be done. And so when we say we're going to follow Jesus, what we're saying is, I now give over all rights. Now, if there's anything that Americans know about, it's rights. <laughs> I mean, all you got to do is turn on the news, and you're going to hear everybody talking about their rights. Everybody talking about, you know, this is what I deserve. This is who I am because I'm American. Well, let me tell you, as a Christian, you don't have any rights. You give them up. And you say, okay, it's no longer what I want. It's what God wants. It's not about being American. It's about being a follower of Jesus. What does Jesus want? And I want you to understand that what Jesus wants, it's good all around the world. What Jesus wants, what God wants, doesn't matter whether you're American, whether you're Nigerian, whether whatever, Colombian. We got a few of y'all in here, right? <laughs> doesn't matter what any of us want, it's what does God want. As Americans, we get it bent out of shape all the time, thinking, oh, you know, this is what I deserve because I live in America, or this is how it should be. I've got my rights, and I'm going to fight for my rights. How about fighting for God? And sometimes fighting for God means zipping your lip. Let me just say this. God does not need us to defend him. Okay? Sometimes, because Christians trying to get their rights end up doing more damage than good. And so I want you to understand that God can take care of himself. He's, he's a pretty big God. He's got it. He doesn't need us standing up for him. Now, does that mean that you don't take a stand? Absolutely not. You stand on the truth of God's word. What happens is people get, in, they get, they get it mixed up. And they think, oh, let me just tell you, there are some rules and things that are in America that are not based on God's word. Did you know that? <laughs> okay. And this is where we get in trouble. Because we start saying, oh, well, you know, this is, we, this is what God wants. Uh, no, you need to check everything against the scripture. The scripture doesn't change. If you haven't noticed, our government changes every four years. You look at the White House and it looks like people are changing every day, <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> So, so here's the thing. Here's the fact of the matter is that there's always going to be stuff that's changing, but God doesn't change. Okay? And, and what needs to happen is that we, as followers of Jesus, we've got to be willing to be changed. We've got to be willing to be put into alignment with him. Let me, let me just clue you in a little bit about prayer, too, while I'm on this kick. And, and that's this, that prayer isn't about us getting what we want. 
Prayer is about getting what God wants. We don't come to God and just, you know, and the, and the Bible is clear. There, are people, there were people who used to do this, man. They would go through it, and they would beat themselves, and they'd cry out to their gods and do all this stuff, trying to get their God to wake up. And the real, they had to realize this God's not real. And for a lot of us who are so-called Christians, we're worshiping a God that's not real. He's a figment of your imagination. And you think, oh, well, this is the God that, that's, oh, God is love, God is love, God is love, God is love. God is also holy. God is also just. God is also a God of wrath. God is a God who has more than an opinion. He does not just have an opinion. All right? And God is the one who sets the rules. God is the one who says what is right and wrong. And that is not up to our discussion. We have to be willing to accept what the scripture says. Otherwise, you cannot say you're a follower of Jesus. It doesn't matter what someone else or what other denominations or what other religions say. It is a matter of what does God say. And God has made it clear in his word what he says and what he wants. And so for a Christian, for a, people, for a person who's going to follow Jesus, we have to be willing to adapt our lives to what the scripture says. If we're not willing to do that, then you have to ask yourself the question, are you truly a disciple? Are you truly a follower? Okay? And so don't make rash decisions when it comes to following Jesus. Because following Jesus is going to require a radical shift in the way that you live. And if you're not willing to make that shift then you're, you're going to really be unhappy because you're going to be riding the fence. And God's made it clear. Don't ride the fence. Pick a side. Where are you going to be? Are you going to follow me or you're not going to follow me? The choice is up to you. And so you have to make a choice. So Jesus goes up and he prays for these people. And he's praying over them. And he says, which ones do I need to select to be my disciples? And, and it becomes clear to him. Okay, these are the ones that I'm going to choose. So he goes and he chooses them. And, and look, Jesus doesn't make mistakes. And so he went he prayed for them. And then he came down and he chose them. Twelve of them. And yet even one was what? Someone who would be a traitor. And betray him. Some people would say, oh, well, Jesus made a mistake. No, Judas made a mistake. Jesus doesn't make mistakes. Judas made a mistake. Okay? And so it's not on God that Judas betrayed him. It's on Judas. And this is what we've got to understand. That a lot of people want to blame God for decisions that we've made. We don't, we don't blame God for decisions we made. And when we suffer these consequences, we can't be pointing a finger at God saying, well, you're the one who... No. Some people say, oh, you know, I can't help it. I'm just this way. Well, it's, just, it's just who I am. Well, that's why the Bible says that in him, you're a new creation. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the whole thing. It's like, yeah, the, 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 something needs to happen. Okay? It ain't God's fault that you're still the way you were. It's on you. Because anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. It's not a matter of being born this way. You can be reborn a different way. Okay? So, so that's the thing. It's like you've got to be willing to come to God and say, God, here I am. I can't fix me. But you can change me. Right? But do you want to be changed? You see, that's what it really boils down to. Do you really want to be changed? Do you really want to be different? What's so amazing is that he handpicked those he handmade. I think that's pretty amazing. And, you know, I grew up playing kickball, you know, in the playground and standing on the fence and really cool kids picking the teams. And I'd be picked last, right? <laughs> Even though I could kick the ball farther, I knew it. They just didn't know it. <laughs> but, you know, the thing about it is this. It's like none of us... It doesn't make us feel good to be picked last. But this is what's so amazing is that Jesus is picking you. He's choosing you. And he's not making a mistake when he's choosing you, when he's calling you. This is something he's prayed about. He knows. 
And so it comes back down to you. Do you want to play on his team? That's what it comes down to. Now, I could have, you know, when I was being picked last, I could have said, no, I don't want to play. And they'd have said, okay, see you. <laughs> the game would have gone on without me. And I want you to understand, God's plan will go on without you. But you can make a choice if you want to be on the team. Do you want to play? Do you want to have a good time? Do you want to have, yeah, oh yeah, it's going to be tough sometimes. But there is no other life than the life of following Christ. Some people think, oh, you know, I, I, my life didn't get better. It got worse when I followed Jesus. It might. But you see, that's, that's the thing about following Jesus. It's a risk. But everything in life is a risk. Everything. Walking down the street in Fayetteville is a risk. <laughs> right? I mean, you, you, don't, you don't know what might happen these days. You don't know. And some people are like thinking, oh, well, that's, it's just too great a risk to trust Jesus. Really? Let me, let me just tell you this. It's a bigger risk to not trust him. It's a greater risk to walk out of this room today and say, ah, you know, I, I'm just going to, I'll take my chances. You don't want to do that. And even though following Jesus may be difficult, it is worth it. God hasn't made a mistake with you or, and neither were you a mistake made by someone else. And so I want you to understand that this morning, if you're in this room, and you all are, and those of you who are watching online, thank you for watching. But let me say this to all of us. You're not a mistake. God has handcrafted you. He put you together. Psalm 139 tells us that he wove us together while we were in our mother's womb. He is the one who put us together. We were handmade. And today, I'm trying to tell you that he is also handpicking you. You came to church for a reason. There are a lot of people who are still asleep thinking, wow, you know, this extra hour, uh, you know, what, what are you talking about? Daylight saving time? No. And they ain't here. But that's okay. You're here. And I trust and I believe in the sovereignty of God. That's a big word that just means this. I believe God's in control. And if he didn't want you here, you wouldn't be here. There are any number of things that could have kept you away this morning. Any number of things. An extra hour of sleep could have kept you away, okay? But, you know, because we are disciplined people, we set our clocks ahead, right? And we, we did what we had to do to get to church. And so I want you to understand that God has a reason for you to be here this morning. He has handpicked you to hear this in person, live and in person. And so please don't ignore what he's trying to say to you, that he has a calling for you. He has a reason for you being here. You are not here by mistake. You are here for a reason. And God has a plan for your life. He wants to use you to make a difference. But you have to make a choice. You have to choose. Do you want to play on the team? Or do you just want to play? You see, a lot of times it's just people just playing around. You know, we, we, we just... We just don't really care. And, and the, the, the thing that I was thinking about when I was looking at this message, in fact, I had a different message and I changed it last night. And so uh, as I was thinking about all of this, you know, when it comes to disciples and people being disciples of Jesus, unfortunately, the word for Christian has taken on a completely different meaning these days. It, it's been so watered down that it really has no meaning at all. Whereas back in the days of Jesus, when you were being called a Christian, it really meant something. In fact, it wasn't a name you gave to yourself. You didn't just walk around, you know, with a cross around your neck. You just walk, walk, walk around and let people just say, oh, you're, there's, you're a Christian. It wasn't just something you just tick off on, a, on an application. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. No, it was a title that someone else gave to you because they saw so much of Jesus in you that they said, oh, there goes one of those Christ followers. There goes one of those people that are trying to be like Jesus. There goes one of those people that, that yeah, they've kind of separated their lives so much that they live differently. If I were to wear this out in normal places, I would get some looks. 
Probably get a lot of looks. And I might get some comments. Some people looking at me, you know, saying, what are you doing wearing that? You know, you ain't, you ain't African. And you know what I'd say? Oh, yes, I am. How many times you been there? Right? I've been there 13 times. I'm a chief. That's right. I got my hat. I got my cane. I got my credentials framed up at my house. Because you see, the thing is that they ain't been there. So they don't know. But isn't it real easy to judge? Isn't it real easy? But you see, the thing about it is this, is that I can wear this with full confidence knowing that I am an African chief because I have been there, because I got everything that goes along with it. I know where I'm going. But I'm going to look different. I'm going to act different. I'm going to speak a different language sometimes, right? Undeo, Mama Imela. That means thank you very much. And even though I only know a couple of words... <laughs> I know something, right? And you see, that's the difference between following Jesus and being a true follower of Him and just someone who's just coming to church and playing the game. You've got to, there ought to be something distinctively different about you. You ought to know some of the Bible. You ought to know something about what God is talking about. You can't just be playing around. It says, one day soon after Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. I don't know if I've ever prayed. I've probably prayed a couple times all night long. But it wasn't necessarily about God's will. It It was really more of just out of pain and hurt and anger, right? Which is most of the time when we go to God in prayer. But but this is so important to Jesus. He's about to make some decisions. That is so important for him. He spends all night long praying about it. And then he comes down and it says at daybreak, he called together all of his disciples. And you think these are already disciples. They're not already disciples. These are, this is all the crowd. All the people who've gathered around that see Jesus doing all these miracles. Those are his disciples. Those are his followers. Okay. So they all come around, and they say, oh, he's coming down, he's coming down. Let's, let's hear what he's got to say. So he starts saying, okay. And then it goes on, he says, and he chose 12 of them to be what? Apostles. What? What's the difference between an apostle and a disciple? Anybody know? You see, we kind of think it's the same thing, right? But it's like he says, no, they were all disciples. They were all followers. They were all gathered around. But Jesus comes down and he chooses 12 specific people to be apostles. So I had to look it up myself. Because even though I've heard and I know what the word means, I want to prove it to you. In Strong's Concordance. Apostolos. It means a messenger. One who is sent on a mission. Now these apostles, again, were handpicked. And look at what it says here. Here are the names of the 12 apostles. So they were disciples, but then they had a specific, special designation that they were apostles now, given this task of going and proclaiming, being a messenger of the gospel. Here are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also called Peter. Then Andrew, Peter's brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, James's brother, who was also the son of Zebedee. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him, from Matthew 10, 2 through 4. There's three other places where the names of the disciples appear. Here again in Mark chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, it doesn't designate them as apostles, just simply gives their names. But as you will see in all of these lists, they pretty much follow the same listing, the same pattern. Okay, And Judas is always listed last, as he should be. Okay, And so the, the, the fact of the matter is this, is that Jesus goes out, he selects these people who were among his disciples, he gives them this designation of apostle. Now, 
why, uh, why is this so important? Well, look here in Acts chapter 1, verse 13. This is after Jesus has died. Judas has betrayed him. Judas goes out. He hangs himself on a tree. He falls from the tree. His insides explode. Okay, it's kind of gross. But this is what happens to him. And it goes on in Acts chapter 1, verse 13. This is after Jesus has already ascended. It says, When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, James, uh, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas. There's a different Judas, okay? There's two of them. Just like we got, you know, a couple of Darren's and Devon's and James's and John's all around. Okay? So they had, this was a popular name. So you can see that there's only 11 there. And so this is what happens. It says in Luke chapter eleven fifteen, why did they have to, to get another one to replace Judas? They got this guy named Matthias, and here's why. Look at Luke eleven fifteen through 18. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, The scriptures declare, My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of the religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. You see, Jesus goes into this place, this, this temple, and he's going there to worship. But he sees that everybody's not there to worship. Some people are there to just make money. Some people are there to, and they're cheating everybody else. So what does Jesus do? The Bible tells us in another place, he actually took some cords from one of the curtains and he wove them together like a whip and he's going around and he's chasing these people out. He's like, get out of here, get out of here. Right? He's chasing them. He's taking the money tables and he's turning them over. I mean, this was a riot going on. Money is flying everywhere. Doves, you know, pigeons and feathers everywhere. Stuff is just happening. And everybody's like, dude, this guy is radical. He's, this guy's crazy. Let's follow him, right? <laughs> Let's follow him. And they're like, that, that's the kind of guy I want to be around, right? And so Jesus has passion for his father's house. But then the people who should have passion for their father's house, what do they do? It says they began to plot to kill him. Everywhere Jesus went, the religious people, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, were trying to find a way to kill Jesus. They were always scheming, looking for this opportunity to do that. And so Jesus, knowing this, all right, he selects 12 people. Why 12? Anybody know? the 12 tribes of Israel. You see, Israel was not doing what God wanted them to do. The 12 tribes of Israel were not worshiping the Messiah. They were looking to kill the Messiah. So Jesus, knowing this, says, you know what? We're going to have a different plan. Since the people I've chosen do not want to worship me, I'm going to choose 12 different people to represent the nations. And those 12 people became the apostles. You say, well, how do you, how do you really know that? Okay? Look at this. Afterward, Jesus, uh, Mark chapter 3, 13 through 15. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him. And they came to him. Then he appointed 12 of them and he called them his apostles. They were to accompany him and he would send them out to preach giving them authority to cast out demons. One of the things about being an apostle, okay, there were a couple of requirements to be an apostle. The first one is this, is that you had to be with Jesus. So not everybody could just be an apostle. You couldn't just say, oh, I'm going to be an apostle. No, you actually had to walk with him. You had to actually be with him. From the very beginning, you had to be a follower of his. Another thing was this, is that you were going to go out and you were going to preach the gospel. You're going to proclaim what Jesus was telling you. You're going to preach and teach the same things he did. And how would they know? Well, because they would have special authority to do things that other people, normal people, could not do. And so when we get to Acts. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time 
when we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. There's first requirement, right? It's got to be somebody who's going to be with and has been with Jesus the whole time. Who has seen Jesus. From the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us. Whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So they had to see the resurrected Lord. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they all prayed, O Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry. For he has deserted us and gone where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other eleven. So the twelve is really important to God, to Jesus, because he was setting up and preparing people for his kingdom. The twelve apostles serve as a special role in the kingdom. Here's their role, Luke 22, 29 through 30. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I now grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve apostles are going to be the judges of the twelve tribes of Israel. So they were selected for a specific reason. Just as God is selecting you for a special reason, for a special purpose. Some people may say, and you may, you know, differ on this, about are there apostles today? Um, If you look at those qualifications, I would say no. But there are people who are called apostles because they're messengers or missionaries. But that is why we use the word missionary as opposed to apostle, okay? Okay. Because a missionary is someone who has a mission, and it comes from that word apostolos. But we use the word missionary because it is not someone who has physically seen the Lord and traveled with him from the beginning. Okay? We have not done that. So that's why we use that word, in case you were wondering. So here's a good time for me to take a break. Um, I haven't done this in a while. And so I want to do it today. I've got some uh, marshmallow eggs here. So get your hands ready because we're going to pass them out. And, and, and the reason I'm doing this, yeah, some of you are like, what? What's going on? All right, this is weird. Yeah, okay. Um, every now and then I just toss things out. And, uh, and so this is going to go along with the sermon here in just a second. So everybody ready? Here you go. Marshmallow eggs. Okay. Share with your neighbors. Okay, so while you're, while you're enjoying those marshmallow eggs, um, here's the thing. I want to share a story with you about the hog and the hen. You see, the hog and the hen were having this conversation, and the hog and the hen thought, you know, we need to do something really special for the, for the rest of the farm. And uh, so they were having this conversation, and they said, oh, you know, what should we do? And, and the hen says this, hey, I've got a great idea. I've got a great idea. Let's have bacon and eggs. The hog was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't know if I like that idea. The hen's like, why? It sounds like a great idea. The hawk said this, because all you want to do is contribute, but I got to give my life. You see, that's what it means to follow Jesus. We don't just contribute. You got to be willing to give your life. We don't just come to God and we don't just come to church and say, oh, you know, I'm just going to give a little bit. I'm just going to plug in when I feel like it. You see, there's a big difference between a contribution and a commitment. And I want to ask you today, are you just contributing or are you committed? Are you willing to say, yes, I am completely 100% all in? Because those are the ones that God is going to use the most. Those are the ones that God is going to use to change the world. So, real quickly, I want to talk to you about the new math. Okay? I don't know if you've heard there's a new math, right? Yeah, there's a new math going around and it doesn't work as good as the old math. And uh, in my opinion, and the old math is much simpler, right? And it's more understandable, a lot less. Yes, yeah, I guess it's because we're old, right? But, 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 you know, Jesus has a new math. And, and I want to explain it to you. If you didn't know this, here's, here's where I get this from. It's because the word for disciple in the Greek is actually mathetes. <laughs> you see where math is there? 
Mathetes. Okay? And so Jesus has this new math. And he comes to his would-be followers and he says this. He's like, look, I want you to follow me. I have chosen you. But now, will you choose me? That's what Jesus is getting at here. And he's like, I've got a new math for you. And the first one is this, is division. Division. We, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, we can no longer be divided. We can't be divided in our attention. We, we can't be divided in our affection. We can't be divided in our unity. And so Jesus says this. He's like, look, if you're going to follow me, what does he do to this, when he comes to the disciples? He'd already met them before, right? He's, he already knows who they are. So when he's walking by the Sea of Galilee, he's walking on the beach, he looks at them and says, hey, guys, come and follow me. And the Bible tells us what do they do? Immediately. Immediately. Now, a lot of us would think, oh, wow, that's pretty amazing. They just, they just decided just like that. No, this wasn't a rash decision. They already knew Jesus. They had already heard some of his teachings. And so when Jesus says, come and follow me, they've already processed it. They've already thought about it. And they said, this is the time where I make my decision. No more division. I'm not going to be a fisherman anymore. Jesus says, I can now be a fisher of people. So I'm going to leave this life behind. No more division. The new math says, I'm not going to be divided. I'm not going to waffle back and forth. I'm going to be completely devoted to Jesus. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come, to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. You see, Jesus somewhat throws a net. I think it would be kind of interesting, you know, if Jesus was going fishing, he'd just throw one line out and say, hey, Peter, psh, gotcha, come on in. Hey, James, psh, fishing for you today. Come on in. But Jesus doesn't do that. And so I'm not going to be here today and say, okay, you, 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 you. I'm just throwing a net. Because Jesus said, hey, all of you come. Come. He was walking by. He saw both of them. He didn't just say, hey, I'm going to take one and not the other one. He said, no, come follow me. Come follow me. So the invitation is open to all of you. Jesus is fishing for all of you. He wants all of you to follow him. He wants all of us to be unified. He wants all of us to worship him. That's what he wants. But you've got to make your own decision. Jesus call, is calling people to move from part-time to full-time. Wasn't it awesome for you, you know, when you worked a part-time job and then your, your employer comes to you and says, you know what, you're doing such a great job, we want you full-time. I mean, I was excited when I got that news before, right? I mean, for people, somebody to look at you and say, man, you know, we want you to work for us, like, not just half-heartedly, not just part-time. We want you all the time. And this is what Jesus is saying to you. I don't want a part-time employee. I don't want a part-time follower. I want somebody who's going to be in it all the time. I want you to follow me. I want you to serve me. I want you to work for me 100% of the time. You say, well, you know, God's not calling me in the ministry. I can't afford to go in the ministry. Listen, it's not about getting paid for the ministry. Your life is your ministry. Your life is your ministry. Whether you get paid for it or not is irrelevant. How we live is our ministry. Do other people see Christ in you? There's a big difference between being a contributor and being fully committed. And I want to say that if our church is going to grow and become all that God wants it to be, we need people to be fully committed. Now that commitment to you may look different than my commitment. But you have to make your commitment. And you have to wrestle that out with God. You know, I'm at church all the time. Like every Sunday, I'm here. If I'm not at church here, I'm at church somewhere else. On vacation, I'm at church. 
Because my commitment is not just to new vision. My commitment is to God. Okay? And so I want to just say to you, these are things that you've got to wrestle out. How important is church? Yes, we want you to be here. And if you're not here, that's fine. Just be somewhere in church worshiping God. This is not the place for everybody. I get it. I'm a little weird. Okay? I'm a little different. I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea. It's okay. All right? But that's part of the reason I'm here. Nobody else would take me. But I'm just, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yes. And now you're suffering the consequences. Yes, I'm sorry. But, but you know, the thing about it is this, is that we all have to make choices. But you see, the choice isn't based upon my location. The choice is based upon who I am. And so I make that choice because of who I am, not just because, oh, well, you know, people aren't going to know. I'm, I'm in Florida this week. They're not going to know if I'm in church. I go to church because that's who I am. I give. That's because that's who I am. Don't give. Look, we don't want your money. God doesn't want your money. But God does say, if you're going to follow me, this is part of how following me looks, is that you worship me with your giving. You worship me, and you trust me with your money. For those people who get hung up on a tithe, let me just tell you, tithe is an Old Testament principle. Yes, it is, an Old Testament principle, OT, okay? You know, we're, we're NT. Actually, we're NV, right? But, but we are, we're New Testament people. Jesus doesn't say anything about giving a tithe. No, he doesn't. In fact, he says, give it all. <laughs> oh, let's go back to Old Testament. <laughs> let's, go, let's go back to OT. <laughs> let's go to OT, right? Because Jesus says, give it all. He doesn't say, just give me 10%. He says, I want it all. I want you to be fully committed to me because if you are fully committed to Jesus, then you know what? It's not your money. It's his money. It's not your life. It's his life. It's not your job. It's his job that he's working through you. So, no more division. Minus. Get your toes up. I don't mean to step on them this morning, but Jesus said this. He said this to all of them, not just his 12 apostles. He said this to all the disciples. If anyone wishes, desires, wants to come to me, he must come after me. He must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That means you're going to have to be willing to minus some things in your life. You're going to have to be willing to scratch some things out and start saying, you know what? It's no longer me. It's no longer what I want. It's no, oh, but isn't God going to, God will forgive me. God understands. God does understand, but God also understands commitment. This is why the Bible says don't make a promise without counting the cost. This is why the Bible says don't make a vow hastily because God hates it when we make a promise and we don't keep it. So that's why I'm trying to tell you this morning, don't just haphazardly say, oh, I'm going to follow Jesus, because following Jesus may mean the eradication of everything you want. It will mean that. Because you have to submit your will to him. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. This is Jesus talking. Jesus is saying, yes, I want it all. I want everything. You say, well, isn't that kind of unfair? I mean, no. How is it unfair when he's the one who gave you life in the first place? You see, but we don't look at it that way. We, we, we tend to think, oh, well, everything I got, I earned. Uh, well, this is mine. You know, it's like whatever that, that show, mine, 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 no, the cartoon, mine, 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 the seagulls, right? The seagulls, yeah. And, 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 and that's what we sound like. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. It's mine. We sound like, you know, two-year-old. It's mine. It's mine. Here, here's yours. No, it's, this is mine. And God is like, no, it's really mine. It's really mine. I lent it to you. I am allowing you to have it. I've given you this life. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to trust me with it? Many of you know that this is true, the new math. I minus X equals nothing. X is Christ. See, Christ is the representation 
and represented by the letter, the Greek letter X. So even at Christmas, when people think, oh, I'm, I'm, marking, I'm marking Christ out of Christmas. Ah, ah, Christmas, Christmas, ah, I'm marking Christ out. And they put an X there, <laughs> they just don't even know. <laughs> They're still saying Christmas. Because <laughs> X means Christ. In the Greek, it still means Christ. You see, God has a sense of humor. God has a way. He, he, people think they're so smart. Oh, I'm just going to mark him out. No, you're just going to proclaim him more. In your ignorance, you're still proclaiming him. And so the thing about it is this, is that I minus Christ is nothing. However, Christ minus I equals my why. You want to know why you exist? You exist because of Christ. But you only find your meaning and your purpose in life when you do the new math. And you've got to take I out of the X. You say, where does that biblically? Let me show you. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, minus, minus, and count them as rubbish, minus, minus, in order that I might gain Christ. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. If you want to know God's will, be willing to turn yourself over to Him. Romans 6, 11 through 14. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, minus, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members as, uh, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin, will no, have, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What is he telling us here? You must be willing to minus yourself. Even John, in chapter 3, verse number 30, said this, I must what? decrease, he must increase. I must minus myself out. Minus myself out so that he may increase. And when he increases, I discover why I'm here. My purpose in this world is to glorify God with my life. That's your purpose in this world. Will you choose it? Plus, When you minus things out, if you're not careful, you know what you're going to have? You're going to have this, this vacuum. And this is what happens. Is a lot of people end up, they, they, they make a decision to follow Jesus, and they start trying to do the right things, but they get so focused on all these other things they've got to give up, and they don't replace it with the good things that are going to help them. We were watching uh, The Karate Kid the other day, the original one, the best one. And, and Mr. Miyagi takes Danielson. And he gives him some wax, right? Y'all remember? Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. And you didn't know that was a biblical principle. Because, you see, the Bible says, put on, put off. Put on, put off. Put on, put off. Let me show you. Colossians 3. But now you also must put them all aside. Put off anger, wrath malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with this evil practices and have what? Put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman, but Christ is in all and uh, Christ is all and in all. Jesus goes back to, and he says this, look, when you are putting on the right thing, you know what? There's going to be no division. You're not going to see each other. There is no division. You're all the same. You look at one another and you say, okay, I see, there's, I see Christ, I see Christ, I see Christ, because that's who I'm looking for. Put on Christ. So as those who have been chosen by God, or chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, look at that. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, your first thing should be forgive. 
That should be the first thought that comes to your mind. Forgive. Let me forgive. And yet, we jump to wrath, anger, malice, bad speech. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you should also forgive. Beyond all these things, what? Put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. You see, if you're going to put off these things, then you've got to put on these other things. If you don't put on something else, let me tell you, you will go back to the old life. If you don't replace it with something, then the old things will come back and they will fill that void. The principle is put off and put on. You've got to add these things to your life. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in the Lord. There are several other verses I could give you here. I'll just let you write them down. Colossians 3, 8 through 11. Or no, I already, I already gave you that. Okay? So the last part of the new math is this, X. You say, how can we multiply? How can we grow in our faith? No division. You've got to be willing to minus some things out. And you've got to put on the right things. You've got to start getting in the scripture. You've got to get in prayer. You need to add these things to your life. And if you do, look at what Matthew 28 says. He says, therefore, go and make disciples. He says, go and do the new math. That's what he says. Methetes. Go and do the new math of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them these things. Teach them the new math. Teach them that they have to be willing to make a decision because a decision will change your life only if you follow through. You see, so many people think, uh, we're just going to make converts. How many people want to accept Jesus? Let's get everybody to raise their hand. Okay, you're a convert. Listen, that's no. Just because you say a prayer doesn't mean that you're automatically a follower of Jesus. One decision determines your direction. It's discipline that determines your destiny. You've got to be willing to make the same decision every day. He's calling us to be faithful to the end. You have to make the same decision over a lifetime. You keep getting up every morning saying, Today, I will follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Though no one go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Every day, this is what you have to say if you're going to be a fully committed follower of Jesus. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people who call themselves Christians, but they're really not because things just don't equal out. He says, you will receive the Spirit you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem and throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus had called his apostles at that time, and he called his disciples afterward. The apostles went and they made disciples, and those disciples made other disciples, and that is why we are here today, is because they did the new math. Because they were willing to pay the price. Because they didn't take it lightly when they said, yes, I am a follower of Jesus. It wasn't just something that they did to fit in with a group. It wasn't just something to be part of a club. It was something that they gave their entire life to. And it didn't matter what somebody else said or did. It was what they were going to do. And you have to make the same choice. Would anyone look at you and know that you're a follower of Jesus? Does it all equal out? Does how you say and what you say live up to how you live? Does, your live? does the way you live really speak volumes about who you are? And it really does speak volumes about who you are. It's not enough for us to just take the parts of the Bible that we like and cut out the rest. We take all of God's word because all of God's word is true. And so... Your love for one another will prove that you know the new math. That's what Jesus says. Jesus says, people will know that you're my disciples. People will know that you know the new math by your love for one another. A disciple equals a Christian. And a Christian equals someone who has the love of God. They were first called 
Christians in Antioch. Some of you may have known that. When they called them Christians, again, it was a derogatory thing. They were saying, oh, there's, there goes a little Christian. But you see, back in those days, to be called a Christian meant that your life was on the line. You were in danger. I'm going to show you a video here about the 12, and, and actually I think it's got a couple of other people who were martyred because of their faith in Christ. And it's because they were so committed, they were so given to this mission of passing on the truth and the life of Jesus Christ, they were willing to die for it. And because they were willing to give their lives, we have what we have today in the Scripture. We have the freedom that we have today to worship God because of their commitment to the Lord. So let's watch this video, and then we'll have a chance to respond. you see things like that and understand that this is very real I don't know how we cannot be moved by that when you look at these 12 apostles and 13 if you include Paul and all but one was martyred in cruel in very cruel ways you think about having your skin filleted off you think about having being thrown from a pinnacle and then beat to death. Talk about beheading. Talk about John, who even is the only one that said, they said, you know, he, he died a natural death, but he was supposedly dipped in burning oil and then exiled to the Isle of Patmos. You see, for them, when they said, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus, even Matthias, who was replacing Judas, says he was stoned and then beheaded, right? You see, to say that I've been called by God is a very, very important thing. When you say, yes, I'll go. Yes, I'll follow. Because there's no telling how it's going to turn out. You've got to be willing to give your all. It's not a game. 
and our brothers and sisters around the world, which is why we're focusing on missions. There are people around the world today whose lives are on the line because they identify with Jesus. And Jesus is standing with them. I want to encourage you today. Are you completely in? Are you doing the new math? If you've been divided, make that choice today. Understand that Christ is calling you. He wants you to come. But know that if you come, the life that you're facing needs to be his life. And we surrender all. I'm going to ask the band to come on out. Back, those of us who are from, you know, old churches, we used to sing that song, you know, I surrender all, I surrender all. But I wonder how many of us live that song, I surrender all. Today, I don't know how the Lord has spoken to you, but if there's something that you need to deal with, the altar is open. I'm going to invite you to come and pray. And Maybe some of you need to renew your commitment to say, yes, God, I'm going to be all in no matter what. But I want to encourage you, don't come because somebody else comes. Don't come to be impressive. Come because you know that this is what you need to do. Commit yourself to Jesus and let him be the Lord of your life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the founders of our faith. Lord, who followed you, they obeyed your call. And even though they were not perfect by any stretch, you used them. You hand-selected them just as today you're calling all of us to be willing to step up and live a committed life, to be distinctly different in this world. And that may mean some persecution. That may mean eventually for some even losing their life. There are people around the world today, God, who are suffering because they are Christians, because they have identified with Jesus. Lord, let us not, let us not take it for granted. So, Lord, we pray that you would take us and use us right where we are, that our life would be evident of Christ in us. And so today, Lord, I know you're extending an invitation to everyone here. And I pray that all those who hear your voice would come and follow you. In Jesus' name.